morning again. Um, <clears throat> so we are, as I mentioned earlier, we're wrapping up this series today, the, the Family of God, where we are looking at what it means to be the church that God made us to be. Uh, and I'll mention as we get started on the lesson today, um, I would love for as many of you as could uh, to come back on Wednesday evenings. We On Wednesday evenings, we are uh, in this room, we are together, and we discuss and have some conversation around the lessons that we have on Sunday. Uh, it's been some, some really great conversations. We take some of these things uh, just a little bit deeper, maybe bring up some things that didn't, uh, didn't make it into the, the lesson on Sunday. And so I would encourage you, it, you would be blessed if you uh, spend your, the mid part of your week uh, here talking about these things. Uh, and so I encourage you to take part of that. A lot of people have been, have been coming and it's been really encouraging to see that uh, growth on Wednesday nights as well. Uh, but as I said, we are finishing off this series. It is look at uh, the places in the New Testament where the, the scripture writers uh, use the term church, ekklesia in the Greek, to talk about uh, this group that God has put together. This family of God. And we saw through this series that the church is not something that we build. Uh, it is something that Jesus himself builds. He said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not uh, prevail against it. And so we are part of something that Jesus is building. We are not all the same. We come from different backgrounds. We have uh, different personalities. We have been uh, gifted in various ways, as Dale read for us a moment ago. We have uh, all of these different gifts that God brings together. And so we have a diversity among us. And I don't just mean in this room, though certainly in this room, but a diversity of the church that spans the globe. Uh, people of all ethnic groups and languages and skills and talents and age and, and gender and all of these, these things, they come together uh, to form this one unified thing. So this church that God builds, this temple that Jesus is constructing for God to dwell in, he quarries those living stones from all sorts of different quarries and brings us together in a unified way. And as we are built up by him, as we grow in these ways, we find opposition in the world. We find difficulty. We find that actually, even though it is a massive blessing, we do suffer. And somehow, strangely, in spite, not just in spite of the suffering that we face, but through the suffering we face, God builds the church. And we support each other when we face those things that are difficult. We have this uh, amazing support group. When the church is functioning the way that it's supposed to, we have a support group like nothing else on planet Earth. We are here to pray for one another. We are here to comfort and encourage one another. We are here to learn from and to teach one another, to offer guidance to one another. And in all of these things, we see the blessing that is the church. And last week we talked about uh, it is the, uh, the place where we actually find our identity. I think it's at the core of who we are, that we are members of the body of Christ. And the word that Paul uses over and over for that is that we are saints. We are saints. We have made mistakes in life. We have uh, sinned. If you're just looking at our actions and behaviors um, through our lives, yes, we are sinners, but God looks at us and he says, I'm giving you a new identity. No longer are you sinners. You are, in fact, saints. And so we've been given this identity and we live uh, into that identity by his power. We become more and more a more accurate reflection of what God says we are. And through it all, and this is where we're going to conclude today, through it all, God is weaving us together into his glorious tapestry. It's an image that I've given you already in this series and we're going to revisit it today. We are the glorious tapestry that God is putting together and we serve a significant purpose in this world. God has given purpose to our lives. He is working through us which means that this family, this thing that you are a part of, this, um, this church is worth investing yourself in. 
is worth putting all that you have, all that you are, uh, joining together as a group and, and unifying all of our efforts and resources and, and our minds in the same direction. It is worth investing in because it is a significant purpose. The church is not a hobby. Uh, it's not a side interest. Um, not, it's not even, it can't even just be your favorite hobby among your hobbies. It is central to who we are. It is core to our identity and everything else in our lives flows from it and is in service to it. And when we examine all of the things in our lives, anything that detracts from that or gets in the way of it or, or prevents us from putting all of ourselves into being members of the family of God, then those things need to be set aside. Like, it is the most important thing. We looked at the passage we're going to start with this morning. We looked at it last week when we talked about our identity as saints. Um, look at what he says here. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you see how he starts with that identity of who you are and being called out and, and, and given this identity of a, a chosen people. You are, you are priests for the king. You belong to God. You are wholly set apart for God. And he moves from that identity that he flows from that identity right into your purpose. Right into your purpose. So that you will proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. How do we proclaim his excellencies? How do we do that? It is something that we do together. It is part of, of being that, uh, that tapestry. It is part of who we are. It is part of our role as saints to proclaim that. Proclaiming his excellencies is more than saying good things about God, although it includes that. It is a lived proclamation. It is something we show with our lives. It is something that we show in our relationships with each other. Our lives are his excellencies on display through who we are and how we choose to live. The word for that is glorifying God. Bringing glory to God is living in that way that shows God to the world, shows, proclaims his excellencies. And glorifying God is a unique responsibility and privilege of the church. First point that I'll make this morning is that Christ has assembled his church to bring glory to God like nothing else in all creation. The church is put together for this purpose, to bring glory to God. Now, to be sure, God has always set in place things that proclaim his glory. Um, I'm reminded just now that as, as Jesus was uh, entering into Jerusalem and uh, people were, pro were, were shouting out, praising him, and uh, some of the leaders said, hey, you should tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, if, they, if they're quiet, then the stones will cry out. Like, like they're, they're, God is going to be praised, right? Um, God has always had things in place to proclaim his glory so that the world can see his goodness, can see his power. One of the things that God did in history was to establish his dwelling place, the temple. The tabernacle and then the temple. And, and in the temple, there were all kinds of things that proclaimed the excellencies of God. The structure itself was magnificent, right? It was beautiful. I mean, it was, it was really the most magnificent temple, a really structure in the world 
when it was around. People would travel just to see the thing. I mean, it was more impressive than the pyramids of Egypt. It was beautiful, polished and shining. When Jesus talks about a city set on a hill and shining your light, we'll look at that passage in a minute. Uh, People pictured Jerusalem and the temple shining out. All the, the gold and the fires at night that would be around it, reflecting off of it, you would see the place for miles and miles around. It's beautiful. It proclaimed God's uh, majesty in his presence there. But even within that yeah, complex, even in that place, um, there, were, there was decorations and, and things that God had, had called to be placed there uh, that proclaimed things about him. You would see um, carved and, and painted images of things like grapevines and other agricultural type things that communicated, intended to bring to mind kind of the the Garden of Eden, the place where God had walked with his people, and this was a representative of that, and this was the place where God's presence dwelled among his people at that time, and proclaimed what God wished for them. There's also a lot of mystery that surrounded it, because uh, the, the Holy of Holies, the place where God's actual presence was, was hidden behind a curtain, Right? And so there was some mystery, and even though God's presence was in the midst of them, there was also a bit of a separation that was communicated. It showed his, his holiness, his set-apartness. And so the temple itself proclaimed the glory of God. And if you went into that place also, you would hear the sounds, and you would see the sights, and you would smell the smells of perpetual sacrifice, of what it took to be able to even get Close to this God, again, reinforcing his holiness, among other things. But even before that temple existed, God had put things in place that proclaimed his glory, his greatness, his goodness. Creation itself, creation itself proclaims the glory of God. Paul says that in Romans chapter 1. Uh, he says that, uh, you know, that it, it's from, from the beginning of creation, it's been, it's been proclaiming God's nature. Uh, so the people are without excuse. They've seen it all around them, all the time. And I think of uh, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. Um, sometimes people wonder... I've heard people say, you know, if God wants me to believe in him, why doesn't he just show himself? Like, like, like why, doesn't, why doesn't he just like appear and take away any doubt so we can all just see his glory right in front of us? Like he does. Like, like all, all the time. <laughs> like it is, we've just gotten so used to it. His glory is so uh, so profound around us all the time that we were numb to it almost. Like, like it's just so glorious. Um, he shows us. I and my family, maybe you too, I, I'm always, we're always looking at the sky. Uh, at, at nighttime, you know, on a clear night especially, uh, we, see, we see the stars and um, we point out, you know, the, the planets that we see, I'm always thinking, oh, that's, th- when, what planet is that? It's probably Venus, you know, I'll pull out an app that I can look at my phone and see, oh yeah, that was Venus and Jupiter or whatever. Um, and we, are, our family, we're always looking at the sky uh, because it, it is one of those things that just never gets old. It takes, it just con- consistently is amazing. And those things are, are proclaiming God's goodness. They're proclaiming God's greatness, his, his holiness, and his majesty, and his power. Have you seen some of the stuff that's started to come back from the, uh, the new James Webb telescope? Uh, I mean, we're seeing further and in higher resolution into the universe than humanity has ever seen. Uh, one of the first pictures that came back was, was this one. It's an actual picture from a teeny tiny slice of God's creation. Um, And the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. That telescope is seeing things that no one has ever seen before. And we know that there is far more out there that nobody will ever see. 
There's more than we can take in. Why had God put it there if we're never going to see it? I think it's still just knowing that there's things beyond what we can see also proclaims something about God. It speaks about his glory and uh, his nature. It proclaims God's glory. And by the way, I read this the other day. They're, they're, start, they're, they're finding galaxies that according to their, their theories and understanding shouldn't exist. Like it's breaking their understanding of how this all was formed. That's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't flow. As the more they look into it, like, whoa, this is not what we expected. There's whole galaxies that should not, according to them, exist. God doesn't play by our rules, does he? This is God's glory. But now these things proclaim, but now also what I'm drawing you back to now is that now there is also the church. We proclaim that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul is writing to them about how he, he desires for them to live. And he says, So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. And so when you look at the stars, when you look at the sky and you say, wow, this proclaims the glory of God, recognize that's you too. Like you are stars in the sky, in this world, in the darkness of this, uh, as he say, it, warped and crooked generation against the darkness that is around us. You pop against that blackness as stars shining in the night, proclaiming the glory of God. That's you. That's us. We are, if you will, a galaxy. <laughs> Combined together, the, the power of the shining stars shining into the darkness, the glory of God. We are here to show his glory. Again, what is glory? What is glory? In the New Testament, the word means something like shining and radiance. In the Old Testament, the word for glory means something like weight or honor. That's what we show about God. We show his greatness, his goodness, his holiness in all that we say and in, in how we live. And it's not a single event. It's not just uh, one activity. It permeates everything we do. We are designed to glorify God together. Uh, I've mentioned before that this idea that we are a, a tapestry. If, and I'll reiterate. Um, if we are each individual threads. Um, we are not a tassel that is all just connected to one point but hanging loose and not connected to each other. Instead, we are a tapestry of interwoven threads that come together to put a picture on display. That's what a tapestry does. It is, it is a, an, an artwork uh, that forms a design, paints a picture with those threads and shows uh, something. Uh, the best real example that I've, that I've experienced um, of, of an image like that was several years ago when I was in Turkey. Um, and after, after the tour for the day that when I was there, uh, I think that day we were in Ephesus. Uh, but afterwards, we went to a place that specialized in creating Turkish uh, rugs and tapestries. Um, Turkey is, is famous for this stuff. And so we went to this place, and, and as they were, uh, they treated us with some tea and different things, and we sat around, and they just kept bringing, bringing this stuff out. They, they had guys that were just, they just kept bringing it out and rolling another one on top of it, just kept bringing them all out and piling them up, and there were all these just magnificent things. They encouraged us to take our shoes off, dirty as we were, and walk around on these, <laughs> these things. Uh, and experience. They talked about the process of making all of them, and they were saying each one is handmade by one person. They don't share the responsibility because um, it, it, a lot of it depends on like the amount of pressure and, and things that an individual would do. And if it passed off to somebody else, the fibers might be a different thickness in different parts of the rug. And so, you know, it, it would take them weeks or even months to create one rug, which is why they're so expensive. Um, because you're basically having to pay the the salary of the person that made it for that whole length of time that they were working on it. 
Um, and so, anyways, they, there's these pictures, but they were magnificent. You can see them hanging on the walls at the back. There's so much more uh, to see there. But this is what comes to mind when I think about being the tapestry, except we are woven together by the greatest artisan in all of the universe, creation. Our God himself has woven us together and is weaving us together. And the picture that we form, the design that we make up as we are put together is Christ himself. Right? That's the picture. You and me are woven together to show Christ. We read this passage at the end of the message last week. It describes judgment day. When he comes on that day, 2 Thessalonians 1, when he comes on that day to be glorified, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you is believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. Him glorified in you and you in him. We'll come back to that part a little bit later. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our purpose, as we are transformed into saints, the reason why we are saints, we are set apart, we are made holy, we are declared righteous in justification, is so that God forgives us, so that he saves us, so that we can dwell with him eternally. And because when we are set apart, when we are transformed, when we are made holy, we more accurately show him to the world. It is because of what we are in the church. This interwoven connection of saints that we are uniquely empowered to glorify God like nothing else in all creation. And so briefly... I'm going to talk about three ways. Uh, three ways that, that we glorify God as a church. Uh, and there's probably more. There almost certainly are more, but we'll talk about these three. First one is this. God is glorified when we gather to encourage one another and worship. God is glorified when we gather and encourage one another and worship together. Think about it. The word for church is ecclesia. Ecclesia means assembly. Fundamental to the very nature of the church, the assembly is to assemble, right? It's fundamental, it's built right into the name. Of course, it's not the only thing that we do. You might even make the case that it's not the most important thing that we do. But it is vital to sustain us. And it is one of the ways in which we glorify God. We put him on display when we are together. Jesus said, Matthew 18, 20, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. I'm there. I'm, I'm among them. Not just with them. I'm in their midst. There's a subtle difference there. I am among them. Jesus says his very presence is here. In this place. Every Sunday that we are together... But of course, not just in this place, and not just on Sunday, but every time you and I and you and you are together in the name of Christ, Jesus is there, right in the midst. If you signed up for a small group to be a part of, which Sid's going to tell us a little more about later. If you signed up to be in one of those, when your group meets together in the name of Jesus, it doesn't matter if it's in this building or at your, at your home or at a restaurant or at a park or whatever. 
Jesus is there. When you get together with one another as friends and and play some board games and and maybe pray with each other and share a meal together, together in Jesus' name, Jesus is there. He is with you. And so when I talk about gathering to encourage one another, I absolutely include what we are doing right now. It's a big part of it. It's an important part of it. But it's even more than this. Gather to encourage, gather to worship, And when we do, God is on display. And I just want to encourage you, take every opportunity. Who doesn't want Jesus to be in their midst, right? Take every opportunity to be together with the saints. Be together wherever you can. God is glorified when we gather to encourage one another and when we gather to worship. Um. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I love this passage. He just, he begins with, a lot of the things that describe what we do here while we're together on Sundays and other times, right? Talking about you know, the dwelling on the, the, the Word of God. Experiencing teaching and exploring the wisdom from God. Singing those, those psalms and those hymns and the spiritual songs and expressing thankfulness. And you think about prayer that we offer to God in those times. And that really describes what we strive to do in our assemblies. right? Amen. But it doesn't Stop there, right? You notice he, he goes on, and it's like, yeah, if, if, if he's describing an assembly, and I think he's at least describing that, um, he goes on from there. He says, and whatever you do, whatever you do, everything, take it with you when you go. It extends to beyond that. Do everything. To do things in the name of Jesus, by the way, is to do things in a way that represent him well. It is, it is to say that if, if this were a, if what I'm doing right now were some kind of document, Jesus could sign his name at the bottom and say, that, that represents me. Okay? That's what doing something in the name of Jesus is. And so it has to, we, we want to extend beyond this place. And our, our walk absolutely must. Our, our walk absolutely must extend beyond this place. Like we should be together out there as well. If, it's part, if part of our purpose is of glorifying God is to display God to the world, how will we do that if we're not in the world doing that? Right? If, we, if we just display it to ourselves in here, and I realize we're on camera and displaying it over the internet, but if we're just doing it in here, how is that going to put God on display to the world? And so, yes, we encourage one another here. We praise God together here, but we take it with us when we go. Jesus said, alluded to this already, Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give Glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let them see. This is not about showing how good you are, right? This is not about about pride being on display. This is about showing the goodness of God through what you do in his name, right? There's There's a subtle difference there, isn't there? We want the glory of God to be seen so that they may see Your good works. The glory of God should be seen in the good that we do by his power and in his name. And you notice then that it leads others to give glory. And so it's a contagious glorifying in this sense. So we will come back to that idea in a moment. But God is glorified when we gather. And God is glorified as we serve together. And as we minister to the needs of those around us. 
as we go into this world carrying the, the torch of his light with us, bringing his nature, his greatness, his goodness, his holiness, his desire for people to be uh, restored, as we bring that to bear in the lives of those around us and however God opens those opportunities, God is glorified. The world around us, this is not going to be a shock to you, but the world around us is hurting. It is broken. And it is in need of a Savior. We can look at that brokenness. We can look at the depravity that comes from it in the world. We can see the evil that grips so many. And our response to that, our feeling can just be one of disgust, and anger, and in many ways, rightfully so. But it should also stir up within us a sense of compassion. A recognition that the people around us that we see that are ensnared in that brokenness and trapped in that darkness are captives of the real enemy. That are in need of being liberated. We should have eyes like Jesus that looked at the people and he saw among them they were like a sheep like sheep without a shepherd. The world around us is full of people who are misled, who are abused, who are held captive, who have been warped by the evil one. And they are in need of help, in need of liberation, and God has equipped the church to reach out, has equipped the church to connect them with him, By putting his glory on display. Jesus said in John 15, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. God is glorified as you bear fruit, Jesus says. And when you do that, you are proving that you really are my disciples. You understand from their culture what a disciple is. Um, it's more, uh, more than what we think of often as a teacher and a student relationship where you're just trying to learn the, the information. The disciples patterned their lives, not just the disciples of Jesus, but disciples of any rabbi, patterned their lives after their teacher. They want to do what he does. They want to go where he goes. They want to learn to think like he thinks. They want to become a faithful reproduction of him. They want to be a copy, right? That's why Peter, when Peter sees Jesus walking on water, his instinct is to say, hey, call me to come out there and walk on water. Because that's his rabbi, and he wants to do what his rabbi does, right? And, and so this is, this is the mindset, and this is what Jesus is saying, like, if you want to prove that you really are my disciples, then bear fruit. Then you'll be doing what I'm doing. Then you'll be exhibiting my real nature to the world. He said to his disciples also in Mark 10, 43, Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, which is his way of referring to himself, came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I came to serve. And if we want the world to see Jesus in us, then we've got to serve how he serves. That's how we show the world what he is like. When we make the choice to serve others, especially when we do it together, in his name, we are glorifying God. Anytime one of you guys or groups of you guys volunteer your time and help serve food from our our food room over here, you are ministering to the needs of the community. In the name of Jesus, you are glorifying God. Anytime a a group of you get together to help somebody that's moved into our community um, load or unload a moving truck, in the name of Jesus, you are glorifying God. Every time one of you or a group of you have gotten together to help somebody with their home maintenance or their car maintenance and ministering to those needs in the name of Jesus, you are glorifying God. When you have given clothing to those who are in need of clothing, when you go and you visit the sick, 
you are glorifying God, I would encourage you to pray for those opportunities. Pray for those opportunities to present themselves and pray that you will recognize them when they do. Because as you step into those things and as you serve others and minister to others in the name of Jesus, whatever, whatever it might be, you never know how God will use those, those encounters. You never know what seeds you are planting or perhaps you are watering. You never know how God will use those unexpected encounters to bring unexpected glory to him. And so God is glorified when we gather. God is glorified when we serve. And it leads to the third of the three. That God is glorified as we show him to the world and they are drawn to him. As we serve others, as they see us um, encouraging one another in worship, as they see those things, God is glorified as they are drawn to him. Winning people to Christ Winning people to Christ is probably the greatest thing that we could aspire to. Um, and yet a lot of us might shy away from the idea because it seems intimidating, right? It seems like there's a lot of weight on it and surely there is um, a, a lot of weight of importance on it. But understand that what we mean here when we're talking about glorifying God in a way that draws people to him it's not always about being able to win all the debates. Although some people have a gift in that way. It's not about having all of the answers and being able to, to throw down with anybody that comes at you with anything. It is being someone through whom people see Jesus. It's simply that. I don't even mind include some of those other things, right? But it is being someone who, who, in many different ways, people see Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 12, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Jesus said, When I am lifted up, I will draw. I will draw men to me. And so our job is to lift up Jesus. Now, in the context of, of John 12, John writes in a way that is multi-layered, right? Uh, and Jesus means that be, he's alluding to being lifted up on the cross. He's also alluding to uh, being lifted up to his throne. And it's also the ways that we lift him up for others to see. Um, and Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, I will do the drawing. You be faithful to lift him up something we do together. And this is what we are talking about. We show him to the world by the ways that we talk, by the ways that we act, by the things that we show are valuable to us. We are faithful to lift him up and he draws. Uh, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and said to his disciples, this is the, vi the last words of the Gospel of Matthew, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go and make disciples. These were the, the, the last words that, that Matthew wanted to, to end this story about Jesus. Jesus telling his followers to go and make disciples. And I already told you what disciples are. Faithful reproductions, right? Make more people that exhibit what Christ is really like. That's our mission. And that glorifies God. This is sometimes referred to as the Great Commission. Uh, Dallas Willard um, referred to it in at least one of his books as the Great Omission. Because quite often the church, despite this being kind of the calling from Jesus, forgets to, to do it. Leaves it out. The Great Commission should not be the Great Omission. It should be what we are doing, what we are about. We glorify God in a way that leads others to glorify God. We exhibit Christ in a way that leads others to be transformed so that they exhibit Christ as well. It is a blessed calling 
a blessed mission of the church that glorifies God. And this aspect, this third aspect of drawing others to him, I think glorifies God the most. Because we glorify and others glorify as well. It adds to those who are glorifying. So, God is glorified when we gather. God is glorified when we serve. God is glorified as others are drawn to him. That's how this glorious tapestry works. It's the power of God weaving our lives together, working through us to show himself to the world out of his love for all who bear his image. One final thing. One final thing, and then we'll begin to wrap up. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so Paul says, we see his glory, and it changes us. We see his glory, and we are transformed by it, and he is moving you and me to a greater level of his own glory. Like we are reflecting it back to the world and in greater measure, his glory becomes by his power and his grace, our glory as well. That's the final point that I'll make. As this body brings glory to God, he also graciously invites us to share in his glory. It is a beautiful thing. As we are drawn more and more into him, the church, the body of Christ, takes on increasingly his greatness, his goodness, his holiness. We're transformed more and more into that. It is imparted to us. The church, hear this, the church, by his grace, is itself glorious. The church, the body of Christ, is glorious. We are part of a glorious tapestry. And that's part of what Jesus prayed for in John 17. Uh, maybe you've read Jesus' prayer for the, the church that would exist um, in the future. In John 17, he says, I don't ask for these only, these people around me here, these disciples in my presence only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you Father are in me and I in you, that they, may, they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So he prays for the unity of the church. And then he says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. You see, wrapped up into this idea of being unified in the church is wrapped up into the glory of God in the church. He has given his glory. He says to the, the Father, the glory you've given me, I have given to them that they may be one. Right? So the glory of God unifies us. The glory of God is in the church. We may think of the glory we are given as only being, um, only being with God in heaven after death. Or we think of the glory that we receive in Jesus' second coming in the, the resurrection of the saints. And to both of those, yes, certainly. There is glory in those, but there is glory in the church to experience now. The church is glorious. God is present with us. Jesus is in our midst. He is working through us, and it is his glory that shines out of us. It is a blessing to be part of this glorious tapestry woven together. So, may we live out our calling. And may we receive the blessing of bringing glory to God. 
May we remember every time we see examples of the greatness, the goodness, and the holiness of God in the creation around us, that we, as the church, are created to do that too and all the more. May we seek to be together to the glory of God. May we continually serve to the glory of God. May we draw others to Christ to the glory of God. May we praise him for the great blessing of being in the church, the family of God, his glorious tapestry. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to read one final scripture, and then we'll sing a song. Um, Our elders and I will be at the back of the room, and uh, we are there if you need anything, small or large. If you want to talk to somebody, you want prayers, or you've already made the decision and you're ready to be baptized, uh, we can do that today. Um, If there's anything you need at all, uh, we'll be back there for you during this next song. But let's, uh, let's conclude with this passage. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. If we can help you this morning, please reach out as we stand and sing. I heard